I want to discuss pain today and at the risk of being a little disjointed, I've put together some thoughts. I mean, I think about pain a lot. Of course, people who are coming to me are almost always complaining of pain that's affecting their lives. But when it comes to being an orthopedic physical therapist, the tests and the treatments that I employ can often be painful. And so part of my job is, you know, teaching patients about what this means, how it can be effective, how it can be a warning sign, etc. And I think some of the cultural misconceptions about pain start with this idea of no pain, no gain. And I imagine this theory came out of the idea of training, for example, weightlifting, meaning if you're not doing something to stimulate a response that can be perceived as pain, you're not going to make any beneficial gains. And I would argue that, yes, that's true for a lot of training, but it's not really pain. Muscle fatigue and soreness and the feeling of exertion, I would say, are distinct phenomena when compared with pain. So yes, no pain, no gain, maybe apropos in the gym, it's very rarely, it's, it's not a term that I employ with patients. And yes, it's true that some disorders need some type of pain in order to resolve, but it's not this willy-nilly kind of all-encompassing no pain, no gain philosophy that I teach to patients. There are very specific types of pain, amounts of pain, places of pain, et cetera, that I will accept and that I will deem to be actually therapeutic for a patient. When it comes to pain with um, treatment, the amount is also you know, of importance. It can be temporary or it can be pain that lingers. And while most of the pain that is temporary is acceptable, I'm not accepting pain that's lingering unless it's pain that's kind of centralizing. And that's a very specific type of movement of pain. Centralization is when you have a spinal disorder that's radiating pain into an extremity and with specific movements or therapies, the pain progressively moves central back to the spine. And in some cases, it becomes more intense as it moves centrally to the spine. And I forewarn patients about this and I tell them, of course, ways to mitigate that. But that's the only type of kind of lingering pain I'll accept. And of course, it's not really a lingering pain in that it's just it's the same type of pain, essentially, but it's no longer in the calf or in the thigh or in the buttock, it's now in the low back. Or the same can be said for the upper extremity. It's no longer in the shoulder or the shoulder blade or the arm, it's now in the neck. So pain, if I accept it as part of treatment, almost always needs to be very temporary, very specific. Obviously nothing that I prescribe for a patient should create that their pain is becoming worse and or more frequent. But pain is not just in the domain of treatment. Pain is also in the domain of testing, especially when it comes to musculoskeletal testing. Now, getting your blood drawn to test your glucose is not that painful for many people, but it's a pain that we've culturally become accustomed to. And it's something that we accept as part of the process of doing a blood draw. And tests for orthopedics, by and large, are imaging and orthopedic special tests in the mainstream idea of orthopedics. And then the main reason I am divergent from that type of care is that I also use repeated movement testing, and that's the test I rely on most heavily for patients. But going into an MRI is often very painful for some people. You know, lying there when you're neck is on fire or you have sciatica raging down your leg can be very disturbing. So people will accept that type of testing pain. And I point that out that sometimes the test that I use can also be painful. And it can be similar to thinking about, well, getting into an MRI machine can be painful as well. X-rays, much quicker, of course, not generally causing a lot of pain. But when it comes to orthopedic special tests, they can also be painful. I mean, one of the signs of a positive orthopedic test is that it reproduces the patient's pain. So as I've mentioned in videos, pushing down on a rotator cuff test with an empty can or full can test, for example, it's a positive test if it's weak and or painful. Doing a McMurray test for the meniscus 
is one sign of it being positive is reproduction of the patient's pain. There are other tests that are orthopedic special tests we use in the clinic that do not have to do with pain, like an apprehension test of the shoulder or a carpal tunnel test, maybe reproducing tingling. But by and large, they can reproduce very temporarily the patient's symptomatic pain response. When I use repeated movement tests, that's when it's important to understand the pain response that's acceptable or not. For example, let's just go with a standard low back pain patient. If I'm using repeated movement tests to see if that person has a mechanical joint arrangement as the root cause diagnosis, say I start with prone lumbar extension. If the patient goes into that lumbar extension on his or her stomach and it's really painful in the low back, I allow that we can push into that as long as when the patient gets up into standing again or walks around the room, we have not created more pain for, for that patient in contrast to before doing that exercise. Again, the caveat is if the patient presented with buttock or leg pain, not low back pain, and we do that exercise and the patient gets off the table and has low back pain now, but less buttock and or leg pain, that increase in pain in the low back is acceptable. But for repeated movement testing, often pushing into the lesion, pushing into the mechanical joint problem is painful for that one to two seconds when you actually hit that joint in the right direction. And sometimes I'm looking for that pain because that indicates that we're hitting the spot correctly. If you don't go to end range, for example, for most patients, you will miss that pain response. And I think that's a very important um, detail for clinicians to remember is that if you don't get to end range with passive overpressure in most instances for most joints or with the patient's overpressure with spinal movements, you may be missing the lesion because you think, for example, thoracic rotation looks full and it's not painful, but if you apply that overpressure to get the last five, 10 degrees, the pain can light up, whether it's in the spine, the shoulder blade, the head, the arm. So going into that pain very temporarily where it's ouch for one to two seconds is almost always indicated, but the, whether or not it is indicated is determined by the patient's response after. So pain during the movement, but a better response after, meaning a symptomatic or mechanical baseline improvement after doing the movement indicates that the movement needs more testing. Now, Repeated movement testing can also be painless, um, but I'm expecting for most patients that we move into that pain very briefly. And let's say the person does 30 repeated movements into lumbar extension on my evaluation, and I see a positive response mechanically upon rising from the table. At that point, it may be beneficial to add some more force to help push that joint with overpressure, with external pressure into more extension, and that may reduce the person's pain. That's obviously a very important detail for the evaluation. If more pressure feels good and provides a beneficial symptomatic and or mechanical response after, then more force would help mitigate pain and also be indicated. So repeated movement testing, of course, takes a lot more than a five minute lecture to learn, but the pain response to a movement is I think scares some people and they're not afraid to, they're afraid to go into a movement that hurts. And I would counter that often, mostly, most commonly, we need to go into a movement that hurts. And some analogies I give to patients are that pulling out a splinter hurts or ripping off a band-aid hurts or in a musculoskeletal situation, relocating a dislocated shoulder hurts but you need to do it to be to get the effective care. So I'm very considered when I speak to my patients about pain. I detail the responses that are acceptable. If the more you do of this, the less it hurts, keep going. If the more you do of this, you're noticing I'm getting more painful, more stiff. You know, I wasn't waking at night before, now I'm waking at night. You absolutely stop the repeated movement testing at home and bring that in, intel back to me. Because at the end of the day, Repeated movement testing is answering the question, what happens to your body when we do this? It's not answering the question, does it help? That's a very elementary 
kind of understanding of what repeated movement testing is. Because if someone comes back and I've moved their thoracic spine to the left in order to affect right buttock pain, and the person comes back and says, Laura, I stopped moving to the left in thoracic rotation. It was just getting so much worse in my right buttock. Well, that's not the end goal that either of us wants, but now we have a really strong indication that we have the location. We have the root cause in the thoracic spine and we can make the buttock pain worse. And now we need to seek the movement that makes the buttock pain better. So again, my classification or my algorithm that I'm thinking in my head for orthopedic disorders is LDDF, location, diagnosis, direction, force. So if I'm testing a direction of the thoracic spine and the person gets worse, then I've pretty strongly indicated to myself that we have the right location. Now we just need to go with finding the direction or the other direction that would be beneficial. And the diagnosis is likely confirmed in that case as a joint derangement. Because again, if there were a muscle strain, moving the thoracic spine should not impact the buttock. Or if there were a nerve entrapment in the buttock, moving the thoracic spine should not impact that. So worsening of symptoms, that's temporary because as soon as that person abates going left, the pain should dissipate. Then, you know, causing extra pain. For me as a clinician, I understand that patients don't want extra pain, but sometimes that's part of the process. If you do 30 left rotations in the clinic and the buttock pain is better, I wanna test more at home. But 30 repetitions is not enough to give me a very strong answer. 300 is, or however many you're going to do in two to three days. So I would send somebody home with that if there's a better response in the clinic, but after more and more reps, they would start to notice that the buttock pain is getting worse and they would stop. So that intel is really important for confirming or at least semi-confirming to a high degree, the location of the disorder and the um, diagnosis of the disorder, we just have the wrong direction. So again, of course, I'm not trying to make the buttock pain worse, but it can be part and parcel of testing. I do not have a magic wand to tell me which direction that thoracic spine needs. I have testing that I use to the best of my ability, but I also know that it's called repeated movement testing because you need to do it repeatedly. And while some people might think that 30 repetitions, which literally takes three minutes, is repeated, it's not. It's not enough because just think about your joints in your day. You're moving them thousands of times per day. So 30 repetitions, even to end range, is not a lot of intel. We need more repetition. So that's kind of what I'm speaking to here a little bit. The amount of force when I do repeated movement testing can of course impact someone's presence or absence of pain. Now there's five levels of force I use in repeated movement testing. The first level is just the patient doing the motion. For example, with the extension on the stomach just going up or the rotation and sitting just turning all the way that the patient can. The second level is when the patient applies some overpressure externally. The third level is when the clinician does. The fourth level is mobilization. And the fifth level is manipulation, which some people call adjustments or cracking. So I have to use a safe and appropriate amount of force in order to get the testing results that I desire. And the testing result that I desire is, is this the right location, (laughs) diagnosis, direction, and force or not? So I've run into some problems with this over time. And I think this is where most clinicians, you know, will find it to be somewhat of a struggle because I had a patient come to me many years ago His insurance allowed two visits. He told me that was all he was going to give me and he had had years and years of low back pain. On the evaluation, I went up to clinician mobilization. He came back the day or two after and berated me in front of another patient that what I did hurt him. And I regret having mobilized him and I wouldn't do that today, but it didn't hurt in the moment. And I knew that we didn't have very long together. Two visits is obviously a, you know, makes no sense for trying to address somebody's chronic, long-standing symptoms. Um, but I, you know, wouldn't apply that much force today. At the time, I did. But there's that line to cross because some people 
might respond beneficially to that force. And again, there's no stamp on somebody's head telling me I can tolerate this much force. There are so many factors going into the amount of force that someone's joint or for any musculoskeletal problem, any ligament or muscle, etc., can tolerate. And I have to use the clues that I glean from working with the patient as to what that amount of force is. For example, for anxious people or maybe depressed people or patients who have fear of moving and catastrophize their symptoms, I'm obviously going to use less amount of force. For the person who says to me, I don't care what you need to do, just push hard, that gives me the green light. And I tell them, you know, I don't, if I think it's appropriate or not. But there are also other things, you know, comorbidities, age, um, frailty, other musculoskeletal problems, those things are all part of my thought process when I'm thinking about how much force to apply to a patient. So we have those five levels, of course, but how quickly I go through them is based on my clinical decision making. And so the opposite of doing too much force and the patient getting very angry with me, I have plenty of patients where I don't apply apply enough force. And I use the word enough loosely because Again, how am I supposed to know how much force the patient needs in perfectly in every situation? If I don't apply, apply enough force or have the patient apply enough force to his or her joint, there may be no effect, no response. And then the patient's frustrated because there's no effect. So I want clinicians, or excuse me, I want patients to know that again, there's nothing yelling at me, I can tolerate mobilizations or I can only tolerate patient overpressure. I have to make that decision. And at below that line of force is there's no effect and the patient's frustrated, there's no effect. And above that line of force, there's the pain increased and it was intolerable and it was too much force and the pain is, or excuse me, the patient is now angry and discontinues care. But in either case, the patient can dis discontinue care. So I, you know, have to <laughs> tread that line, so to speak, and I do my best and I'd rather err on the side of caution, but I have to find that amount of force and that amount of pain that's generated so as to keep the patient on board, happy with what the testing is doing, for example, and it can be a hard kind of bargain to, to negotiate. So for movements, excuse me, for treatments, I've been talking about movements because repeated movement testing can become the treatment when it's fruitful, of course, of course, if you're treating a tendinopathy, that's different. And I'll give a sidebar about tendinopathies, which is for those disorders, I'm looking to recreate the patient's pain and I want it to be moderate. So I want that patient to move into the pain that is uh, their, their pain on a progressive basis throughout the day in terms of tendon remodeling. But for other disorders other than joints and tendinopathies, for example, we're not necessarily creating pain if we are rehabbing a ligament sprain. We might be doing some proprioceptive works, maybe some other balance work, possibly some strengthening or joint stuff for maybe causative factors, but I wouldn't expect a lot of pain in that situation. So different disorders have different kind of pain expectations, but when it comes to joints, repeated movement testing and repeated movements as treatment into the directional preference, then I like to make the um, analogy to patients that if they were going to have surgery for this disorder, that would be extremely painful. And the only reason that they accept that pain is because they're anesthetized. And that's become this cultural kind of just norm, right? Like, oh yes, you can cut into my hip, you can cut through my skin, cut through my muscles, saw off a piece of my bone, put in some metal or ceramic or whatever into the joint, sew it up again. That is an extremely painful process that people would not tolerate if they weren't knocked out or if they weren't under some form of anesthesia. That pain is obviously very predictable. And some patients after surgery have to use very potent painkillers because the lingering pain is so intense. So while that may be predictable pain, I want to inform patients that the testing I do can be painful as well. It's just on a much, much, much smaller basis. And it's a little bit more unpredictable because obviously if we do 30 or 40 repetitions in the office and then at home, the more you do, the better you feel, you're a happy camper. But if the more you do at home, it starts to ache more, that was something you may not have expected. 
but in the large scheme of things, it's a lot less pain than going through surgery. And these are kind of, when we think about it, movement or other kind of conservative outside the body modalities and surgery are the two main camps of fixing musculoskeletal disorders. Anti-inflammatory injections are fixing inflammation. They're not fixing disorders. Pain pills or other kind of pain mitigating modalities are not fixing orthopedic disorders. They're fixing the pain. So these are the two main parts of how we address orthopedic disorders. Obviously, the vast majority can get better with movements and other conservative measures and a very small minority need surgery, but both of them come with their own kind of recipe for pain. And so I want patients to know that movements can create a little bit of pain, but it's usually tolerable or it's almost always tolerable and there are rules that we apply. And one last thing I'll add is that you know, musculoskeletal pain is something, pain is something we associate with the musculoskeletal system. It's not something we associate necessarily with like diabetes or autoimmune disorders necessarily. But when clinicians are giving you something to try or something to test, for example, take this magnesium at home. And I don't know the therapeutic dose for you personally. There's no flashing light on your head telling me I need 600 milligrams of magnesium or I need a thousand milligrams of magnesium, you be you will start the testing at home and you may experience GI distress when you get to that level of magnesium that your body can tolerate. So for musculoskeletal stuff, I'm also asking patients, go home, take this much, this much dosage throughout the day, and let's see what happens. So I want people to think of it as, you know, we're testing and you're coming back with the the information from that testing in the majority of cases, obviously my job is to find the test that gives us the answer of what is actually the diagnosis and what is actually the most beneficial treatment for the patient as soon as possible. And as sometimes, oftentimes, we get it on visit one, but sometimes it takes a little bit more of testing. But the pain response to that testing and the pain response to any other test that you do in orthopedics or any other kind of disorders is should follow certain rules. So ask your clinician, you know, what type of pain should be expected or not? Because the goal is to, you know, have the least amount of risk and the least amount of pain, of course, but within the bounds of actually getting the information and the effective treatment that we need.